We welcome you to another Sunday School lesson. Sunday School is a blessing and gift from God. While the army of Israel was out fighting wars, David was chilling in his Jerusalem palace where he saw a woman named Bathsheba bathing on a rooftop. He liked what he saw, so he sent for her and slept with her and got her pregnant, even though she was married. So David then called her husband, a prized soldier named Uriah, to leave the battlefield and enjoy some time at home. But Uriah had too much honor to do something like that while his fellow soldiers fought on without him. So David sent Uriah to the front lines, where the fighting was so heavy that it killed him. Then David took Bathsheba as his wife. The young king who seemingly could do no wrong has committed adultery, possibly raped, murdered and deceived everyone in the process. In this lesson, we see how God, through the prophet Nathan condemned David and his sin, and how it led to his confession of guilt. Our first verse says the Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. David's sin displeased the Lord but David didn't listen to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Instead of God sending David's enemies to invade Israel, he sent a prophet to instruct and counsel David. With wisdom and courage, Nathan used a story about a rich man and a poor one to get the message through to David. Undoubtedly David knew the injustice done to poor people by those who have money and power that needed to be corrected in Israel. Verse 2 says, The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle. Nathan continued his story saying that the rich man had many flocks of sheep and herds of cattle. Possessing farm animals such as sheep and cattle was a sign of a person's wealth. Verse 3 says, But the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Unlike the rich man, the only livestock the poor man had was a little female lamb that he bought. The poor man raised the lamb, grew up with him and his children. The lamb even slept on his chest and was like a daughter to the poor man. This information let King David know just how special and dear this only lamb was to the poor man and his family. In a very cunning way, Nathan was actually describing what Bathsheba meant to her now dead husband, Uriah. Verse 4 says, Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. Nathan continued to tell that the rich man had a visitor and in the tradition of hospitality, the rich man wanted to prepare an animal as a meal for his guest. Although he had a flock of sheep and a herd of cattle, he didn't want to take any of his own animals to feed the traveler. Instead he took the poor man's lamb, and cooked it for his visitor. The intent of the parable was to remind David that he had many wives and concubines, but Uriah had only one wife who had been dear to him and laid in his bosom, just like the lamb was to the poor man. Verse 5 says, David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord leaves, the man who did this must die. The king understood the parable to be a complaint made to him by Nathan against one of his subjects who had wronged his poor neighbor. He rendered judgment immediately against the rich man and confirmed it with an oath. David's judgment against the rich man was that he shall die, although stealing is not a capital crime. Verse 6 says, He must pay for that lamb four times over, because he did such a thing and had no pity. Realizing that death was not the judgment for stealing a sheep, he declared that the thief had to give back four lambs for stealing one. Since the rich man, who had everything he needed had not shown the poor man any compassion, David said that was why he must restore the poor man for sheep and be put to death. At this point, David still did not realize that this story was about him. Verse 7 says, Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. 
This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. In plain terms, Nathan said to David, You are the man and by his own judgment and sentence that came from his own mouth, David deserved to die. Nathan reveals that his message was straight from God and now speaks to King David as an ambassador for the great Lord God. God through Nathan, reminds David of the great things he had done and designed for him. God said I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. Verse 8 says, I gave your master's house to you, and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. God continued to remind David of other great things he had done for him. After Saul died and David became king, God gave him power over Saul's royal dynasty and whatever he owned. God also said that David became king over Judah first and later he became king over Israel uniting the two nations. And if what God had already given to David, had not been enough, he would have given him much more. Verse 9 says, Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. God charged David for contempt of divine authority because of the sins he had committed. King David was guilty of breaking God's commandments against coveting, adultery, and murder. David didn't physically kill Uriah the Hittite himself, but because David caused Uriah to die in battle, he was as guilty of his death as if he had murdered him with his own hands. God also told David he took his wife to be his own. Verse 13 says, Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. David's confession is a good example. He placed the blame squarely on his own shoulders. He did not minimize his offense. David realized that he especially sinned against God, not just against Uriah and Bathsheba. The prophet assured David that his sin was forgiven when he said the Lord also has taken away your sin. And as a result, God in his mercy and grace allowed David to live. Verse 14 says, But because by doing this you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. Even though God had forgiven David for his sins, his actions would bring dishonor to God. His actions would give the enemies of the Lord the opportunity to say disrespectful things about him. God would vindicate his honor by showing his displeasure with David. He would do this by allowing the world to see that although he loves David he hates his sin God chose to do it by the death of Bathsheba's child. God forgives sin, but that does not mean that he cancels out all its consequences. Our final verse says after Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had born to David, and he became ill. Once he delivered God's message, Nathan didn't remain in the king's court, instead he went home. True to God's word, David and Bathsheba's child soon became very sick. We are not told what the child suffered from, but 2 Samuel 12 18-19 says that seven days after he became ill, the child died. Yes, sin does have consequences. Nathan condemns David. This lesson leaves us with the solemn reminder that regardless of how godly a person may be, no one is immune to sin. It also reminds us that when sin is not faced honestly it leads to more sin. Finally, we learn that sin often has consequences that continue even after God has forgiven the sinner. Regardless of what we may think, sin is not manageable. We deceive ourselves if we think that we can manage temptation and control how deeply we will fall. David learned what we all should know and that is sin has consequences. Let us take a stand against temptation early and think seriously about the long-term devastation that can be the result of short-term pleasure. Nathan condemns David. 1. 
sometimes the Lord may send us with a message to those in high places meant to convict them of their actions. When that happens, we must be faithful and bold and not afraid, 2 Samuel 12 1-4. God mercifully kept speaking to David even when David didn't listen. When we sense the conviction of the Holy Spirit, we must respond to it immediately, because it might not always be there. 2. Anger alone is not pleasant, but righteous anger has its place, 2 Samuel 12 5-6. Righteous indignation is considered the only form of anger which is not sinful, as when Jesus drove the money lenders out of the temple. 3. God has done so much for all of his children which is reason enough to avoid temptations and sin, 2 Samuel 12 7-9. Remembering what God does for us provides the courage to say no. 4. When we sin it is always against the Lord, but when we confess our sin in his grace he will forgive us, 2 Samuel 12:13. Outright admission of guilt is no excuse making, no attempt at lessening fault, no desire to evade punishment. 5. When Christians sin, we run the risk of giving sinners the opportunity to disrespect our God and there will be consequences, 2 Samuel 12 14-15. Unbelievers would laugh as Christians fell into terrible open sin, and mock God's laws. But God would prove to these irreligious men that Jehovah's righteous rule could reach and punish anybody, and would vindicate his justice from their reproach. We are truly glad you spent time to learn this lesson with us. We hope you are blessed and may share these with somebody else. Thank you very much, have a great week, and God bless you always, dear brothers and sisters.